It's winter and the cold days without much sunlight might not inspire you to spring out of bed each day. But for some, the lack of light this time of year can trigger a type of depression known as seasonal affective disorder. What exactly is it and how might you go about treating it? Well, I spoke with Dr. Stuart Anfang about that and more. So seasonal affective disorder, first of all, is a, is a common phenomena that we see often this time of year. I like to hearken it to kind of hibernation, that as the days get shorter, uh, some of us are very sensitive to the fact that winter is coming. And so the bodies respond sort of like how a hibernating animal might respond. So you might find yourself sleeping more, eating more, craving carbohydrates, having low energy, uh, but rather than just kind of hunkering down for the winter like an animal, it, it ends up making people feel less engaged, more depressed, more down. And so how do you help people understand the difference between, okay, this is something that is right in line with the season and okay, and something that's really more of a problem that they should seek medical help for? So it's a great question. It, it really matters the degree of functional impairment that it causes. So a lot of us in the winter time, maybe we don't love the cold, we're all bundled up, it's harder to be outside, harder to be more active. Uh, so that combined with the season, often there's a lot of eating and drinking and all the things that go around with the season. Um, so it's not unusual to have a little bit of kind of blues or mood difficulties around this time. But the key would those be heavy foods. Alcohol is a depressant anyway. Yes. So if you're drinking more of that, so those are kind of common, right? So that would not be uncommon at all particularly right now this time of year. The issue would be is how much functional impairment is it causing you? And to some extent, how long does it last? So seasonal affective disorder, we, we typically see it around October, November as the days get shorter. And it, should, it typically goes on well beyond the end of the, the holidays into January and February. And often people are not beginning to feel better until March or April or later in the spring. So if it lasts longer than just kind of holiday blues for a couple of weeks, Weeks, that would be of concern. And if it's causing more functional impairment, so let's say it's interfering with your ability to get up and go to work, or let's say it's interfering with your relationships with your family, uh, or if it's causing um, more depressed mood, if it's causing suicidal thoughts or thoughts about whether you would feel better off if you were dead, those would be the kinds of things that would be warning signs that would cause you to seek, seek help. And so for people, you know, I know that I look out my office window about 3.30, it's starting to get dark. I feel this dread <laughs> inside. I don't like the dark. That's something that just isn't something that I am particularly fond of. I know for myself, if I exercise a little more and aren't aware of, eh, let's not eat the chips, maybe let's eat an apple. That's something that I've noticed for myself. What are some things that you could recommend for folks at home that they might be able to do to counteract some of these things if they're feeling them? Absolutely. So it, it is a light phenomena. It's related to light as the days get, get shorter and the days get colder. Uh, for some people, the body responds um, by overproducing a, a chemical called melatonin. You've heard of melatonin being used as a sleep aid. Right. But what happens is it's the same melatonin, but the body is producing more melatonin than it needs. So the net result is people feel kind of sleepy and tired and want to eat more and, and uh, lack of energy. So one easy treatment is to get more light. And so even though it's, it's darker outside, uh, people are encouraged to get outside as much as they can. If they have to be inside to even sort of sit closer to a window and get more access to light, um, you know, some people will go away for a week or two to a warmer climate, a brighter climate. What about light boxes? Is that, are they simulating the same type of light that we would get outside or do you have to get a special kind of light box for that to happen? So you do have to get a special kind of light box and this is not just the lights in your house or a tanning bed or it's not that kind of light. This is a very specific kind of light and it has to be a very bright light. And uh, what it's called is full spectrum light, and you want it to be 10,000 lux. 10,000 lux is how you measure light. Uh, so it's not like the lights in your house, which are a much lower level. 
And you can get these light boxes that none of them are FDA approved. Some may or may not be covered by insurance, but you can buy them you know, through Amazon. You can get them at different places, but you want to make sure that it has the 10,000 lux, that it's not ultraviolet light. That's not what you want, which is kind of the tanning light. You want it to be full spectrum light. And what happens is people sit with that light for about 30 minutes every morning. It needs to be every day in the morning. Why every day in the morning? Just to replicate the sunrise? Exactly, exactly. So it replicates the normal coming upon dawn in the beginning of the day. And your eyes have to be open for it. So you don't look at the light because that would hurt your eyes. Uh, but it needs to be there and your eyes open. You could be reading. You could be doing something else, having your breakfast. But it needs to be 18 to 24 inches from your face and it needs to be 30 minutes or so every morning. Just because we've seen that that 30 minutes helps. That 30 minutes helps and that particular uh, intensity of light helps. Are there certain age groups or types of people, maybe someone who's already has a diagnosed mental health condition that are more prone to this than maybe others? Well, so it's estimated that perhaps four to five percent of the population have some degree of this difficulty. We know that people who live in more northern climates tend to see it more than people who live closer to the equator where they don't sort of uh, have the shorter days. Women are more predisposed than men. Uh, and in terms of ages, it really runs sort of the, the typical gamut. What would truly be the hallmark of seasonal affective disorder, and we'll ask people about this, is does this happen every year at this time? So if somebody says, you know, every year at this time, um, you know, things get bad for me in October, November, and I'm grouchy like a bear, and, it, you know, I don't want to interact with people, and I lay in bed, uh, and then it gets better in the spring. And that's a repetitive pattern that's more consistent with seasonal affective disorder, as opposed to somebody who is, say, 55 years old, has never had that kind of difficulty, seasonal difficulty before, but this year, let's say, suffered a big loss in their, in their life. Mm. And so now they're going through the holidays grieving the loss of a parent. But they've never had seasonal affective disorder before, that would be less likely that that seasonal affective disorder, maybe it's grief, maybe it's complicated bereavement, maybe it's a major depressive episode, but you wouldn't just suddenly get seasonal affective disorder at the age of 55. I think I was reading on the Mayo Clinic website that this can happen for people at different change of season, maybe even spring to summer. Is that accurate? Yes. Yeah, so there is a kind of a, a, a spring-summer variant, which looks a little different, uh, which is kind of the reverse phenomenal phenomena that people get worse in the um, spring or summer summer than they do uh, in the winter, and then they start to do better when the fall happens. For them, the answer isn't a light box, because that isn't sort of the problem. There we would look at other interventions, which might include psychotherapy or other supports, or might include medications. And for seasonal affective disorder, are psychotherapy and medication also options here if the light box doesn't work? Yes, so these are good options. Usually what happens is it, it depends on the severity of the situation. So if it's not causing a whole lot of functional impairment, we might encourage people to get as much light as possible, be as active as possible, watch your diet, things like that. If it's causing more impairment, we might recommend, say, the light box, uh, which you don't need a prescription for, but you want to make sure you get the right kind of light box. And you can you know, look it up on the internet at the Mayo Clinic and other places. There are legitimate health websites which have information about them. Uh, if that isn't helpful, you might consider um, some short-term psychotherapy, particularly cognitive behavioral psychotherapy or problem-solving therapy. And sometimes we find that using medications like antidepressants are, are helpful. The key is, is that this is a common issue. It's a very treatable issue. And people shouldn't suffer in silence. And people, uh, you know, sometimes when people's mood are down, they try to self-medicate with alcohol or with food or with other things. That will compound the problem, as you alluded to. So it's important to, if you think this is an issue, to get help. And the place to start would be with your primary care provider.